okay so galea upper neurotica is a third layer and we are talking about the rest of the layers that is the skin this is how when we dissect we can see the skin layer and below the skin we can see the connective tissue below that we can see aponeurosis see the white fibrous layer you can see yes, also in that one yes sir uh, ma'am we can all see your uh, slide here something is displayed on the screen downloading is okay one second please Can you all see the screen now? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. So here you can see that these are the layers. That is skin, connective tissue, aponeurosis, loose areolar tissue, and pericranium. We will discuss about these two bit later. Okay. Now let us see about these muscle attachments. What are the muscle attachments? together only this muscles together are called as occipito frontalis muscle okay occipito frontalis a short note can be questioned on this also like it can come as galea aponeurotica it can be asked as occipito frontalis muscle clear everyone till here yes ma'am okay yes ma'am okay now yes, Yes, ma'am. Go and read again. Otherwise, you cannot uh, recollect all this. Okay, the presentation I'll give you, the recordings I'll give you by the end of the day. But make sure that you go and revise this study and come up with lot of questions. Okay, what are your doubts? Now, see here. What are the attachments of frontal belly? How it is attached? Okay, it has a frontal belly anteriorly. And occipital belly posteriorly and galea aponeurotica, epicranial aponeurosis connecting the two bellies. Okay, now how it is attached? Let us see the attachments. This is the this is how you can see the muscle. Okay, so how it is attached anteriorly? Anteriorly, it it has no bony attachments. This is a muscle which doesn't have bony attachments. It is not attached to any bone. It is attached to the skin and fascia covering the face above the superciliary arches. Okay, so here the skin and fascia gives attachment to this muscle fibers. See the muscle fibers, very thin flap. So these are the frontal bellies. Okay, it takes attachment. Ma'am, I'm confused with this diagram. Yeah, Baba. Uh, my, I mean this uh, image. Okay. Can you see this? Is these are the this is the. Can you repeat that superciliary arch arches? Yes, I'll do that. So see here, this is the face. Okay, on the face side. Okay, this is on the lateral side, on the lateral view. So what I'm doing, I removed the skin. Okay, and I removed the loose areolar tissue, and now we are looking at the third layer. galea aponeurotica okay so we are looking at the frontal bellies here you can see frontal bellies thin flap of muscle fibers you can see the brownish color isn't it so this is the muscle bellies of frontal bellies this is the aponeurosis see here with a forceps we can raise this aponeurosis and posteriorly can you see this brown color fibers these are the occipital bellies okay clear okay okay so where does it takes attachment it takes attachment from the superciliary arches skin and fascia like overlying the superciliary arches so here above the eyebrows this superciliary arch skin there is a skin below that we have fascia so from there it takes attachment no bony attachment any muscle we always say from which bone it is taking origin okay it takes um attachment so this is the origin of the frontal bellies where is the origin of frontal bellies skin and fascia covering the superciliary arches okay from there it takes attachment goes back which attachment this is called as origin of a muscle origin means the proximal attachment of a muscle is called as origin now where is the insertion insertion means where the muscle is ending 
that is called as insertion so why this origin and insertion is important for us how the muscle contracts okay how the muscle contracts insertion moves towards the origin that is the movement of a muscle okay clear so general anatomy you have studied about the muscle right you must be knowing now what is origin and insertion so this is the origin of the muscle and insertion is the fibers become flattened and they insert themselves into the tendon epicranial aponeurosis okay so they get inserted where into the epicranial aponeurosis similarly let's see occipital bellies from where they take origin from they take origin from where from the external occipital protuberance and superior nuchal lines on both sides we have superior nuchal lines so from here it takes origin so this is the occipital bellies two occipital bellies are like this okay they take origin from here and they go upwards where they are inserted they are inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis okay so these two muscle fibers are taking origin from the anterior and posterior aspect muscle bellies on the frontal side they meet together so there is no gap between the two muscle bellies but occipital bellies we there there is a specific gap between the two bellies we'll go back and see see here two frontal bellies we have no gap but occipital bellies we have nice gap between the two muscle bellies okay so they give into the epicranial aponeurosis okay clear everyone till here origin of the muscle fibers yes yes ma'am can okay. uh, you please repeat the origin of frontal and occipital uh, belly yes Or origin of frontal bellies it takes origin from the it takes subcutaneous origin okay no bony origin frontal bellies does not take origin from the bone they take origin from the skin and subcutaneous tissue covering the superciliary arches so these two bellies join together in the midline and get inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis okay whereas occipital bellies they take origin from the external occipital protuberance and superciliary arches they take bony origin from there they get inserted into the epicranial aponeurosis the tendon flattened tendon so this is the origin and insertion of the muscle now what is the nerve supply we will see later on not right now where is the action what is the action of this muscle whenever we are talking about a muscle remember that the action is important nerve supply is important okay so how you have to write a muscle origin insertion nerve supply action any muscle question comes you have to write this four points okay origin insertion nerve supply actions till here everyone clear yes ma'am yes ma'am don't worry we will do it in the dissection hall again so you will learn more again in the dissection hall you will get more idea what we are discussing today okay so this is on the posterior aspect this is how occipital bellies are seen from the external occipital protuberance and superior nuchal lines this is how muscle bellies come upwards okay these are the frontal bellies already we discussed how it is entered entering now what is the action okay what is the action of this muscle now remember the action is insertion moves towards origin okay but these bellies are actually subcutaneous muscles so they contract together okay when they contract together what happens we see horizontal wrinkles on the forehead okay this is the action of the occipital uh, frontal bellies okay what is the uh, action of frontal bellies forming horizontal wrinkles on the forehead as a result of surprise okay surprise whenever we are surprised surprise you know you move your eyebrows up so what happens we there are transverse wrinkles on the forehead so this is the action of frontal bellies clear everyone yes ma'am so yes, ma occipital bellies are more stronger adherent to the bone as well as aponeurosis so nothing much they provide they are not um, uh, very well advanced in humans actually in lower animals you see this uh, muscles are well developed but in humans they are not of much use but some people you can see that skin of the vault they can move like this you know front and back side 
so that is one of the action where frontal and occipital bellies together do it okay usually we don't see occipital bellies working well so what is the nerve supply the nerves which are supplying is the facial nerve this is the facial nerve facial nerve gives two branches see here this is the temporal branch and this is the posterior auricular branch what are the branches of the facial nerve temporal branch okay this area is called as temple temple where wisdom comes so graying of the hair starts first here so that's why this region is called as temple so any structure related to it is called as temporal region okay so this is the temporal branch of the facial nerve and the posterior auricular auricle refers to ear so the nerve is going back of the ear that's why it is called as posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve okay posterior auricular branch of the facial nerve supplies the occipital bellies so any muscle for its contraction we require from by it is supplied or innervated by which nerve okay clear so you need to understand is these are the motor nerves which supplies the frontal and occipital bellies everyone clear yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am right so you have to revise study otherwise you will forget all this okay so this is all comprising the third layer okay now what is the applied aspect of the third layer epicranial aponeurosis is tightly held by the frontal and occipital bellies so what happens if there is any vertical cut like this no problem because what happens the fibers are already vertically present like this antero posteriorly so if there is you know vertical cuts it's okay but imagine if there is a horizontal cut if if there is a cut like this now what will happen if there is a cut like that there will be pull of the muscle from this side and this side so there will be lot of gapping of the wound okay any horizontal cut will cause lot of gapping in the wound okay what is that called as gaping in the wound is nothing but because of cut of epicranial aponeurosis and the wound gaps more am i under, am i clear everyone yes, yes ma'am okay yes this is the applied aspect of the third layer now let us see fourth layer fourth layer is called as loose areolar tissue what is the loose areolar tissue is the fourth layer it is simple connective tissue which covers the first three layer the scalp proper to the underlying bone okay so it's just a connective tissue but this is the full place where we can get lot of space for the rest of the scalp to move on the vault okay clear now what is more important in this region there are certain structures which are called as emissary veins what is this area what is this structure called as emissary veins okay what is emissary means emissary means an ambassador do you know who is an ambassador indian am ambassador okay or american ambassador that means our country person who is representing in another country or or getting information from other country to our country ambassadors okay so these people are connecting two areas so same like that emissary people okay emissary veins connect two areas what are the two areas the veins which are present outside the cranial cavity and the veins which are present inside the cranial cavity inside the cranial cavity what we have what we have inside the cranial cavity guys what do we have inside cranial cavity csf brain csf right brain and csf so you see that there are blood vessels outside the brain also and inside the cranial cavity so this is the bone okay inside the bone 
the brain is there and the blood vessels are there so these emissary veins are very very dangerous veins because they connect the external veins with the internal veins extracranial veins with the intracranial veins why we call it as dangerous because any infection over here can be spread into the intracranial cavity okay that's why this fourth layer is called as dangerous area of the scalp why it is called as dangerous area because this area contains emissary veins which connect the veins of the scalp with the intracranial sinuses okay what are these sinuses i'll tell you in the coming class okay so what are these structures these are called as intracranial veins with the extracranial veins these structures connecting are called as emissary veins okay clear everyone yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am now, now this that's why the fourth layer is called as dangerous area of the scalp short note question dangerous area of the scalp okay so you have to write which layer fourth layer okay why it contain why it is dangerous area because it contains emissary veins which connect extracranial veins with the intracranial venous sinuses okay so any kind of infection here can go and can cause spread of infection into the veins inside the cranial cavity remember that inside the cranial cavity there are three components okay blood brain and csf now as a rule these three components have to be in a proper composition now if the rule is if one increases the other reduces so that there is maintained intracranial pressure okay this is the rule followed inside the cranial cavity now let us say that any foreign material which enters into the blood immediately what happens the platelets attack it when the platelets attack it they form a clot okay this clot is called as thrombus what is it called as thrombus so if there is a thrombus inside the cranial cavity what is increased here a solid component has increased so what will have to be reduced what will have to be reduced blood csf brain okay blood can it reduce it can't reduce because there is a constant flow in and out i can't hear you can't hear me guys can you hear me everyone yes, yes ma'am yes, you are audible yes, ma'am okay okay so please check your connection dear so you can see that i i'll forward you the videos later on okay so that you can revise or just see how the lecture has been taken so you can see that the whatever the blood clot goes inside it forms a thrombus and because of this thrombus what happens there is a component increased inside the cranial cavity blood has to reduce it cannot reduce because constantly heart is pumping blood upwards with a lot of pressure so it cannot reduce next what is the component csf csf also it's there is a constant production constant drainage of csf so what is the third component the brain now brain can it reduce yes why because the brain is a jelly like substance okay so what happens how it can reduce you may ask how it can reduce there is pressure on it it is not reducing so any structure which is extra can compress the brain when it compress the brain what happens to the jelly you are keeping a jelly inside this cranial cavity and you are pressing it so what happens to that jelly it starts coming out coming out from where lot of openings are there which is the biggest opening the foramen magnum such a big opening right so big opening here what is there here brain stem is there inside the brain stem what is there all kind of important respiratory centers cardiovascular centers are there so any thrombus inside the brain can compress the brain can increase the intracranial pressure and compress the brain and form a pressure of the pressure on brain stem at the um, foramen magnum so when this region get compressed at foramen magnum the person dies because all important centers are there so that's why this is such a dangerous area right are you guys understanding how is the this loop okay you can make a flow chart 
how that thrombus can cause death of a person okay so that's why this area contains emissary veins which are then you might ask why they are present if it is such dangerous structure it should not be present in our body every structure in our body has got a reason okay why it is present because sometimes if let's say blood pressure increased okay blood pressure increased the person has got high blood pressure pressure is here more so some of the blood can get out from here right so it can get out through an emissary vein into the extra cranial veins it can pump out let's say one of the blood vessel inside the cranial cavity is obstructed okay so what happens it forms a connection so it can take blood from outside also so that the brain does not suffer so that is the advantage of emissary veins okay but actually it can cause damage as well that's why this fourth layer is called as dangerous area of the scalp am i all, am i clear guys everyone did you understand yes yes ma'am yes ma'am yes ma'am ma uh, yes. uh, ma uh, does padma padma ma'am have a lecture after this yes the timing she gave was like uh, 150 ha yes 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 Uh, another 5 minutes okay. we'll complete this okay okay yeah sure yeah thank you so now what happens is uh, we have this fourth layer which is important and the fourth layer uh, also is called as there are two clinical important clinical features for the the fourth layer one is dangerous area of the scalp and second is it is also called as safety valve hematoma what is it called as safety valve hematoma okay once again i'll repeat what is it called as safety valve hematoma what is safety valve hematoma hematoma means blood okay blood uh, accumulation is called as hematoma okay so why it is called safety valve hematoma do you see boxing matches any time or anyway in most of the movies they show that there is a hit on the head and suddenly you will see a black eye right so what is actually happening any injury to this blood vessels outside they will start pouring out the blood okay they that will not go into the cranial cavity because the blood has to completely accumulate here okay let's say there is a fracture of the bone okay fracture there is a skull vault fracture and the blood started oozing out blood started oozing out but it cannot go out right there is no cut outside it cannot go out then what happens the blood start accumulating in the fourth layer because first three layers are inseparable aponeurosis is there it will not allow the blood to go out so what is present freely fourth layer so all fourth layer have to be filled okay so that then only the blood can accumulate inside the cranial cavity and cause compression on the brain so that's why fourth layer allows free flow of any injury uh, the blood after injury okay so that's why what happens because it's loose aerolar tissue the blood easily floats in this fourth layer comes forwards because the third layer is attached to the um, frontal bellies and frontal bellies are just attached to the skin so it's not attached to the bone so blood easily can come here accumulate around the eye okay so this why that's why what happens the fourth layer is also called as safety valve hematoma it acts as a safety valve so that there is no compression on the brain when there is an injury to the skull vault bones okay and there is bleeding outside so when the blood accumulates around the eye that is called as ecchymosis okay ecchymosis i have that picture also with me i'll show you mom can you please tell i i'll i'll, I'll show you that okay ma'am yeah uh, i have a doubt uh, when the bleeding goes inside the eyes mm -hmm. uh, not then, inside uh, the eye. Uh, can it, it doesn't go inside the eye it goes into the eyelids okay it goes into the eye yeah, into the eyelid yes so i wanted to to know does it affect our vision no it doesn't because your vision is actually coming from the eyeball there is lot of space in this orbit see this one how much big orbit you have this much big orbit 
eyeball is only one sixth of the orbit. Okay, so you, all your vision is actually focused in the eyeball. Okay, rest of the tissues are there, right? So they are present around the uh, eyeball. So all this see here accumulation of infectious fluid. You can see that infectious or any injury. There are uh, uh, you know uh, fractures, skull fractures. The blood will start uh, drooling from your and then nicely accumulating around the eye. This is called as ecchymosis. E C C H Y M O S I S. Ecchymosis. Okay, or black eye. Simply call black eye. If you can't remember that, you can even write black eye. What is black eye? Let's see because it's the empty wall with hematoma. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, Mama wanted to ask you that empty wall uh, hematoma is different from black eye, and then empty wall hematoma is damaged or disrupted. That time we get black eye, right? Empty wall hematoma. Because the fourth layer acts as a safety wall hematoma. Okay, right? Black and eye. And when that layer is damaged, that time we get black eye. Right? Yes. Is that it? Yes. Okay. So these are the different uh, uh, problems when you see the fourth layer. Now let's see fifth layer. Fifth layer is called as pericranium. What is pericranium? So this is the bone. Let's say this is the brain. Okay, this is the vault bone. Okay, just above the bone. Remember that bone is always covered by an outer covering, which is called as periosteum. Remember that. So this is the periosteum of the skull vault, which forms the pericranium. Okay, so pericranium. Peri means outside. Cranium means vault. Okay, so we have pericranium as a fifth layer, which is covering the bone. Now, how does this pericranium is attached? It is attached exactly at the, exactly at the sutures. Okay, we have various sutures. Can you all see the sutures here by any means? Can you all see the sutures? Can you all see this? Okay, can you all see these lines? Guys, yes or no? Can you all see the lines? Okay. These are. I can't hear you. Can't hear me. Uh. Can you see this? Uh, can you see? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma can you yes, see the sutures? These are called as sutures. Okay, these are the joints, sutural joints between the bones. So here, what happens is you can see that the pericranium is attached adherently to these sutures. So it is separate for separate bone. Okay. So if there is a fracture, let's say there is a fracture of this, uh, you know, this bone, and it this uh, it did not tear the periosteum. So what happens? There will be accumulation of the fluid exactly in the shape of this bone. So you will see that some of the fractures, which are exactly resembling like a temporal bone, like an occipital bone, mostly you know, uh, temporal bone is very common, you know, and uh, frontal bone. Only in that region there is swelling. So we know that yes, there is a fracture, but that did not tear the pericranium. Okay. So this is what is the fifth layer is about. So till here, clear everyone. All of you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. So now this is the next part that is nerve supply, blood supply, which we'll be doing in the next class. Okay. Till here, everyone clear. All of you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. So go back and please revise. This is the first chapter of head, face, neck. And you have to study. I will send this video. I'll share this video. Today's lecture video by the end of the day after going home. So then uh, you can uh, see that I have uh, made a group where all the videos are added to that. So you can uh, revise all the previous videos as well. So there you'll get all the videos at once for my classes. Okay. So please make sure that you see revise. And if you have any questions, please let me know. And I'm sending this presentation also for your group okay so till then uh, till the next session i mean tomorrow anyway we are meeting the next batch and tomorrow don't forget at 11 45 please assemble in the class and if there is any change because i have to call principal sir 
if there is any change in the timing i will all let you know okay please sakshi be in touch with me okay yes sir everyone yeah okay then i'll take your leave thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am